All right, so welcome to our quick review slash introduction to, really this early in the year it's more of an introduction to, the core periphery model. So I'm going to do just a real quick overview of it. Understand that we'll get back to it later, and we'll talk about it in more depth when we talk about development geography. But right now, to help us understand things like population, we need just to have some real basic information. So some basic features of the model is that it's got three levels of economic development, a high level, a medium level, and a low level. And the terms that they use for these, level, these types of development, at high, we call it the core, and we'll explain that in a minute. Medium, we call it the semi-periphery, and low, we call it the periphery. Okay. Every country fits in somewhere. This is very much a geographic model of development. Every country fits in somewhere, and to a large degree, and we'll see this when we look at the maps, you can see it regionally. Okay. We look at why is a given country where it is. What we see is that really history has a lot to do with that. Okay, um, it has a lot to do with the legacy of colonialism and a lot to do with who industrialized and when they did it. Because the earlier you industrialized, the more likely you were to become a colonial power. And indeed, the earliest industrialized of Britain becomes the biggest colonial power. And the old expression was that the sun never set on the British Empire, and for a long time that was true. That it literally, Britain controlled probably half the world. So those are kind of some of the basic features, and again, we'll talk about it in more depth later, but you need, you need a little bit just to help you understand when we talk about why are some areas more developed than others. <clears throat> so our core countries, these are our rich countries or our more developed countries. When we talk about more developed countries, a lot of times you see that abbreviated MDC. You need to know that abbreviation, okay? Because that's one that's going to come up. And really, these core countries, these are the ones that they're the most important economically, in terms of the global economy. They're the ones that are the most important culturally when we talk about um, popular culture and the spread of popular culture. And really, it's a handful of areas. It's the U.S., it's Western Europe, and by Western Europe, we're talking about France, Spain, Italy, Germany, the UK, um, and those countries that are right around there. There's a bunch of smaller ones around there that also fit in. We're talking about Japan. You could make the argument that South Korea is rapidly becoming a core country. A lot of people place it in the periphery, but I think you could make the argument that if it's not core yet, it will be within the next 10 to 20 years. Um, and Australia. Okay. And these countries really are the beneficiaries of globalization, the global economy. They um, developed, industri they industrialized early, and because of that, they fed the global economy and ultimately were able to um, take advantage of that industrialization to slowly but surely push people first off the farms and into the factories and then out of the factories and into education and higher levels of education, which then gets us into a much more service-based economy. Mm -hmm. um, so we have lots and lots of service workers, and to a large degree, we, and by we, I'm talking about, again, that whole list of countries, drive um, economic development through innovation and creativity, and that's what keeps the U.S. developing, that's what keeps Western Europe developing, Japan, South Korea, Australia, um, is that continuous innovation and creativity. We run a lot of the global supply chain. Okay. And poor countries exploit basically every other country. Any country that's poor, that's less developed, core countries are going to be exploiting that in some way. Could be through um, taking in workers or through so-called brain drain, where um, people who are well-educated but live in less developed countries move to poor countries in order to take advantage of the economic opportunities there. Um, but it could also just be resource-based. We see a lot of resource-based exploitation going on, particularly with the resources when we're talking about our periphery countries. Okay? Brain drain is more of a... Um, 
tends to be a little bit of each, but it's more of a semi-periphery concern. So when we look at our map here, our core countries, sorry, they're not in green, they're in orange on this one. I apologize, I had a different map and I forgot to change the uh, label up there. But you can see it's pretty much exactly where I, where I said it would be. You've got Japan over on the right, you've got Australia, um, you've got Western Europe, looks like according to this one, it's pretty much every country in Western Europe except for Portugal. Um, you've got the United States and Canada included as four countries. Okay, we're going to look at this map for each level and we'll, so you can kind of see, but even just looking at it once, you can see where it's very much a regional phenomenon this uh, idea of core and periphery. So our semi-periphery are kind of middle class countries or developing countries. To a large degree, this is most of Asia, really arguably large parts of Latin America, much of Latin America. Um, Eastern Europe falls into this. Parts of Eastern Europe used to be core and they've kind of fallen back into the semi-periphery with the fall of the Soviet Union. Saudi Arabia falls into this because it's kind of the center of the Middle East. Um, and these are, these are countries that are benefiting from the global economy, but they're not driving it in the same way those core countries are. Okay? So just like in our core countries, most people work in service industries. In our semi-periphery countries, most people are working either in agriculture or in manufacturing, and as they develop more and more, they're shifting towards those service industries. Okay? You also see increasing urbanization in semi-periphery countries. Um, not as rapid, interestingly enough, as what we're seeing these days in a lot of periphery countries, but um, the urbanization that's occurring is to a large degree, for lack of a better term, healthier for those um, who are taking part. So there's not, you don't see quite as many slums, and the slums you do see are a little bit, in often a little bit healthier and in a little bit better condition. Okay. And semi-periphery countries, these are kind of in the middle. So they, they exploit the poorer countries, but they're also exploited by the richer countries. Okay, so they're kind of that, that middle level. And their goal is to become poor countries and to get that level of development. So we're back at our map here, and our semi-periphery countries are in, really it's kind of more of a goldenrod than a yellow. Um, but, you know, you see Mexico, you see Brazil in there, um, you see Chile and Argentina, you see pretty much all of Eastern Europe, China, India, fall into there. A um, couple of, a big exception I want to draw your attention to in terms of Africa, we've got... Um, South Africa down at the bottom, a couple of smaller countries, and I'm drawing a blank, one of them probably Kenya. <clears throat> They're more towards um, northern Africa up by the Sahara Desert. Okay, But you can see where, again, we're looking at large regions for the most part. It's not isolated countries. They're actually fairly compacted close together. And to a large degree, these semi-periphery countries, when we talk about that history of colonization, these are countries that under, they either um, left colonialism early, okay, like Mexico and Latin America, so they've had a lot of time to develop on their own, or they were countries that to a large degree were allowed to build up an internal, um, an internal hierarchy of folks, so they were, folks got better educated, essentially. If they had um, an educated class that you don't see in those periphery countries or that you didn't see, sorry, not that you don't see them now, you didn't see them at the time of release from colonialism. And these are, you know, like I said, they were early releases, Latin America from colonialism, to in many cases, either were never colonized, like say Russia, or they, they got away from that comparatively early and got off comparatively light. <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and take a look at, talk about our periphery countries, and these are our poorer countries. Call them less developed, okay, LDC. Again, that's an acronym you need to know. 
and it's most of the Middle East, again with the exception being Saudi Arabia, large parts of Southeast Asia, and most of Africa, which is those handful of exceptions. Okay. And these guys, they benefit a little bit from globalization, but not as much, and they are much more, much more affected by global economic swings. Okay, so these are, the economies are almost entirely resource extraction or agriculture based. And so those global economic swings, for instance, with the slowdown that started in about 2008 that's still going on, <coughs> these are countries that saw their, their GDP, right, their income, go down dramatically. So, you know, it got cut down by 25% or by 50% their tax receipts because to a large degree what they're relying on is exporting resources and the demand went down when the world economy came. Periphery countries are absolutely exploited by countries with higher levels of development. Um, oftentimes for workers, definitely for resources. So one of those things you'll see when we talk about migration in another week or so is that you see a lot of people want to move out of poor countries into wealthier countries even if they're taking a really bad job that people in the wealthier countries don't want. Right? They're picking fruit, they're cleaning houses, they're washing dishes, but the thing is that's still way better than what they can get at home. Okay? And they'll make more money and life will generally be better and they're able to send money home to help out. So that's why workers are moving from those periphery countries into those poor countries. And what you see is sometimes the higher level folks, they move to go to college and they never move home. They settle into those poor countries because life is better, they can make more money, they can have access to more resources. Um, government is better in poor countries. Generally speaking, in the periphery countries, part of why they're in the periphery is because there's poor governance and that hampers their ability to develop. It really prevents them from developing in the way that they need to. And our periphery countries, by and large, I'm going to go ahead and shift to the map here. These are countries, <coughs> sorry, the periphery is not in white, it's in that light yellow. But especially when we're talking about Africa, these are countries that got their freedom from colonialism relatively late and it did not have an educated elite that was able to take over at the end of colonialism. So you see countries in Africa where, for instance, the end of colonialism, you've got, you know, 150 people with a high school diploma and five with a college degree. And they've got to try and figure out how to run and develop a country. And so when that happens, what they basically do is set up systems that are going to um, that are going to enrich themselves. And so bad governance is quite frankly probably the biggest problem and the biggest issue in terms of helping those countries develop. But it takes time to build in and build up those systems and those expectations that would lead to good governance. And so you see improving governance, but Again, it takes time. It takes time to, to develop like that. So that's our quick overview introduction to the core periphery model. If you have questions, let me know. Again, we'll discuss it in a lot more depth later on in the course, but I wanted you to have the introduction so that when we talked about why are we seeing different shaped population pyramids we're seeing, you've got some idea of what's going on in terms of levels of development. So I will see you in class.